Welcome to this week's podcast from Life Spring Church, Wolverhampton. Well, my, we're early today, so you might even get to go home early today. On the other hand, you may not. <laughs> well, there'll be time for eating chocolate. Uh, I, it, I was just uh, changing all my prayer routine this morning, and I thought I just had to kind of do a lot of centering on thanking our Father God that he is a wonderful father. And, uh, and I really enjoyed that, and I, ho- I hope he did too. <laughs> uh, so it's Father's Day today. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, I- I'm, I'm very much aware that when it's a day like today, there will be people who will be rejoicing and glad uh, because they have a wonderful family situation. And I know also that there will be others who will be finding a day like today maybe a bit difficult. Uh, and we have to learn to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I do believe I have a word for some folks here as well today. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, yeah, he whom? <laughs> oh dear. Yes. So, hey, we, we don't normally do this, so I thought I'd do this to start with. But here's a, a few bits of useless information, Okay. Uh, Did you know that Father's Day started in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, in the Middle Ages? Yeah, and uh, it was was a a day when they um, called it St. Joseph's Day. Now, I don't know if that was Jesus' earthly dad or the Joseph of the tomb or what have you, but but they, they called him a nourishing father, a father who nourishes. And so they started off this... uh, this uh, a process in the Middle Ages, and um, I, I find it very interesting. Uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic, but uh, uh, it, it takes them about 300 years before they finally agree to make someone a saint. Did you know that? Uh, and uh, the wonderful thing about uh, when you're a Bible-believing follower of Jesus is that on the very day you give your life to Jesus and you accept his forgiveness through his blood shed on the cross, and you ask Father to be your adopted father, then you immediately become a saint. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, uh, because in the New Testament it talks about to the saints. Saint Andrew? I'm Saint Dave. Yeah, it's good to meet you too. Okay, why don't you turn to somebody and say, you're a saint. Yeah. Now, tell them you might not be perfect, but you're still a saint. (laughs) Okay. And uh, then uh, in 1910, I'm still on useless facts, okay. Uh, In 1910, a group of uh, ministers got together in Spokane, U.S. of A. Spokane. Uh, of U.S. of A., and they they agreed that they would do a series of sermons across the city about fathering and fatherhood. And that was the beginning of Father's Day as we know it today, because the Catholic one was earlier on in the year, but this one was around about the 19th of June or something like that. And, And since then, Father's Day is celebrated in over 40 countries, nations in the world. Isn't that amazing? So that's good. The Bible says, because I've got to get away from useless facts and into the Bible now, but the Bible says, Paul said to Timoth, uh, said to somebody he was writing to, he said, <laughs> you got me. <laughs> uh, he said, you have many teachers, but you do not have many fathers. And, and I, I believe that fathering is one of the most important gifts in the house of God. I, I struggled for years with the whole concept of being a spiritual parent. And young, younger people would sometimes come up to me and they would say things like, I remember Josie said to me one time, I see you as my spiritual dad. And others said, would you be my spiritual dad? And I remember immediately I would be kind of like, well, you know, <clears throat> hold on here. There are implications, you know, to this. And because... Uh, uh, you know, it means commitment and it means that and all the rest of it. But deep down in my heart, what I was really saying is spiritual fathers can disappoint you. Because my experience was the one person that I had 
in this life as a Christian who was my spiritual dad, he disappointed me, he let me down, and he hurt me more than I think anyone has ever hurt me, and he did it in public. And so I was always nervous about being called a spiritual dad. And then I got healed. <laughs> and uh, I remember I went on an RTF. I, I don't ask me what that is. But it, it, it was where, you know, I, I had to answer lots of questions and get prayed for. And one of the things that I gave over was I gave over my fear of disappointing people if I was a spiritual dad. The very next Sunday, I came to church here. And instead of me kind of looking around to see who I needed to avoid, just in case they asked me to be their spiritual dad, I started going up to people and I said, you're my spiritual son, I need to have a word with you. And I was totally changed. And I just delight in this fact that we need more fathers in the, in the house of God. And uh, God himself is a most wonderful father. Is, is it okay if I just chat a bit? Yeah because I feel like chatting. You know, when I first got married and we had our first child, we actually lived in Atlanta, Georgia. Pip, um, Atlanta. Pippa. Atlanta, Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Ah, where the music was good and the hot dogs were even better. <laughs> and uh, uh, we lived there and the guy we were, I was living with, who was this spiritual father and his wife, uh, he came up to me after we'd been there about three weeks, and uh, he said, brother, he said, I won't do the accent. He said, brother, he said, do you mind if I tell you something? And you know, when people do that, you know you're in trouble. And I said, of course, brother. And he said, well, he said, I've noticed that your little girl is walking around like a, a zombie, looking as if she's completely unloved. Why do you never tell her you love her. And I said, oh, because the Americans, they do that all the time. Love you, Barry Harney. Love you to bits. Love you to death. I don't even know your name, but I love you. You know, it's quite, they're, they're crazy. And, uh, and so my wife and myself, we started to tell our little girl, I love you. And within a few days, her life was transformed. It was as if the light went on in her eyes. And she became happy and joyful and all the rest of it. You see, I never had a role model in parents who expressed any emotion. So my mum, my dad never ever said, I love you. There were some occasions when things were really tough and you'd get a kind of a, you, you know that we love you, don't you? And it's kind of like, oh, yuck. Uh, but I never had a role model in this area. I never had a dad who encouraged me. I never had a dad who was a, a role model, discipled me, gave me advice, gave me hugs, took me out for Father Sundays. I never had that at all. And so when we got married and we had our first little girl, I had no role model to pass on. And therefore I needed a father to tell me a father how to be a father. And I have discovered through many years now that fathering is difficult. You know, we have a saying in this church that Father God is always in a good mood. Well, when I read my Bible, I don't always see that's the case. When I see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, when I see God getting angry about sin and wickedness, and I feel that the Father in heaven knows more about emotions than you and I put together. And he experiences so many emotions and somehow he holds himself together. <laughs> Might be, help that he's God, of course, but, but, but you know, and, and therefore whatever we experience in life with our emotions and our difficulties, that uh, he is the one that we can turn to and say, you know exactly what I'm going through. I, I, I experienced that same little girl when she was older. I remember sitting in my garden, I'm being very vulnerable here, uh, I was sitting in my garden and uh, enjoying the sunshine and my little girl, who was about 16, 17, something like that, came to me and said, goodbye, Dad. I said, what do you mean, goodbye? She said, oh, there's a bloke I know. He's just rolled up. He's going to Spain. I'm going with him. See you. And she was gone. And we didn't see her for years. 
Now, I know as a father the emotion that you go through when you love someone and that person leaves you. You know, we all say love is a great emotion, don't we? Well, sometimes it's not. Because sometimes if you love someone and they leave you, it brings all the worst out. That's what love does. So I know as a dad, as I look back at my many years of being a father, uh, that I got a lot of things wrong, which he never does. But nevertheless, a lot of bad things, as well as a lot of good things, happen to us. I, I, I want to tell you this, that that daughter, and some of you know who I'm talking about, uh, she was rebelling for years. And then we had a, a, an amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit in 1994. And she con contacted us, and she said, if this revival is real... I'm coming home, and I will give my life 100% to Jesus. And she did. Yeah, and she has done ever since. Isn't that wonderful? That's him. Let's give him a clap. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> I, look at, uh, I look at my son Jonathan uh, and Marisa, his lovely wife, who's just produced a, a beautiful grandson called Asher. It means happy. It's from the Bible. And uh, uh, I see the way they are beginning to parent. And, and I, I think, where did they get that from? And I think one of the reasons is because as we got older, we began to learn more and more about how to parent. So maybe I got a lot of things wrong with the first one, a good few things wrong with the second one, and not so many wrong things with the last one. Hey. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and, and, you know, and Jonathan and Marisa, they're doing an amazing job with little baby Asher. Six months old, he, they've got him in a routine. They've even taught him now how to go to sleep on his own. And, oh, so many things. It's like, what? You know, what books did you read? Well, I hope that some of it was something that I passed on to them, and especially to my son. And so it's really in, important that we understand what it is to be a father and to know that our father in heaven experiences not only what we experience but so much more you know when I think about the father heart of God I, I, I think of a father who together with his son and the Holy Spirit before anything that was made was made and their great desire was to have a family or rather to extend their family because one thing love does, it wants to reproduce itself in others. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit wanted to increase the family. And then, so they made Adam and Eve after uh, their image, after their image and after their likeness. And when Adam opened his eyes, the first thing he saw was his dad. And when Eve, round the corner, because she was made out of Adam's sight, don't know why, but no, it's probably a very good thing, actually, yeah. And uh, when she opened her eyes, the first thing she saw was her, her dad, her father God. And so the revelation that Adam and Eve has was that God was their father, together with Jesus, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit. That was a great day, but do you know, if we go back before then, it's very interesting because before Adam and Eve were created before human beings came into being. God knew that when he created <clears throat> his sons and daughters, he knew he has this amazing ability to foreknow things. He knew that they would rebel against him, they would disobey him, and they would turn to iniquity and sin. And we know the story, don't we, many of us? And, and yet, even though God knew that his sons and daughters would rebel against him and turn to wickedness and iniquity and rebellion, he still went ahead and created them. You know why? Because God knew the problem, but he had a solution. The problem was sin. But the solution was decided before a man or a woman was made. Because the Bible talks in the book of Revelation about Jesus being the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And so it was already decided in God's heart that he who wanted to extend his family, 
and create people in his image and in his likeness, knowing that they would rebel and do wicked things, that he already provided a solution to the problem. Jesus, the word of God, would become a man. He would be a man just like you and me. And he would live an ordinary life like you and me, uh, and he did. And he was tempted and tried in every way, yet without sin. And there came a time when they hung him on a cross, and his blood was shed in the most horrible way, in dreadful pain, and God imputed to him, put on him, the sin of, of us all. My sin went to that cross. Your sin went to that cross. You see, God had a problem, and it was the sin of man. But he had a solution. And that solution was found in Jesus Christ. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, you will understand the power of the blood of Jesus and the wonderful Father Heart message to you that says, I love you and I want to save you. But let me take it a little bit further. You see, God had a problem, but he also had an issue. And I don't know if you know the difference between a problem and an issue. A problem was solved before the foundation of the world. An issue is an ongoing thing. And the issue is this, that even though his son was to die on a cross and now has died on the cross, been raised from the dead, God's issue, the father's issue was how do I get those rebellious, created men and women who've turned to sin, how do I get them back into my house? And that's why we sang that song, He's Working. He's Working. God is working today, and He's working in this room. He's working in our city, in our nation, across the world, in order to try and persuade men and women to turn from their wicked ways and to come back to Him. And that's the issue He's got. And uh, uh, I'm so grateful that you and I a part of the solution to that issue as we tell people about Jesus. And so therefore the Father is working. And I don't know about you, but I would imagine many of us, if we had the opportunity to share a testimony, I certainly would, would be able to say, I can look back on my life right now and I can see how God was at work in my life without me even knowing it until I came to a point when I felt the Holy Spirit say, will you give your life to Jesus now? And I said, yes. And how many of you have got a testimony? Yeah, put your hands up. So many. We all have such a story. And it's the story we need to tell because when we tell our stories to people, it is God working through you to draw people to himself. Amen? Because you can... You know, you can argue with people about religion and this, that, and the other, and probably get nowhere, but I'll tell you this, when you've got a story, people don't argue with you. The stories are believed. You say it happened to you, then it happened to you, unless they call you a, a liar, you know, which most nice people wouldn't, and even the nasty people wouldn't. <laughs> they just go, oh, okay, that's interesting. And so therefore, God not only had a problem that was solved through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he has an issue for something to be worked through. And if you're a father today, and I include mums in that, but it's Father's Day, uh, if you're a father today, then in your life you will have many issues to work through. Even if you know the answer, even if you know the answer to the problem, you still have to go through it. If I was to say to you today, to those of you who are going through a tough patch, and, and, and if I was able to say to you, God has got the answer, you might go, well, that's really wonderful. But unfortunately, I've still got to go through it. Is that right? And so whether God has an answer or not, you and I have got to go through it. And fathers know this, that when they see their children growing up, mum's the same, they might know what the answer is, but they still have to go through it because there's more than one person in the equation. Let me just look at man for a bit and ask ourselves the question, does man have the, the same problems and issues? And I would say, yes, to some extent he does. You see, man knows that the biggest problem with man is sin. Isn't that right? 
You, you listen to the news, you listen to the parliament, you look at the laws that people are passing and changing, you look at what the police are saying, you listen to the courts, the counsellors, the school teachers, your neighbours, yourself, whoever, and you know that one of the biggest problems in the world today is the sin and the wickedness of people. And we're always trying to pass laws and do things to eradicate evil, but guess what? Evil does not get eradicated. And so these limited ways of addressing a serious problem is a concern to every one of us. How many of you have known in your life fear? Wave at me if you have. Yeah. Yeah. That is a result of sin, and uh, it's an amazing thing, but fear is because I don't know what is going to happen tomorrow, because someone might stop it. We've had murders in the park, we've had, I heard uh, on the news, I think it was, a, a lady of a hundred and something got mugged the other day, in Birmingham was it, somewhere like that, this dear wonderful lady, and someone wickedly, and in awful evil, mugged her. Uh, and, and if I were to tell you, I'm not going to, but if I were to tell you some of the stories of what people do to children, very young children, we, we, we would be like God and we would say, there has to be a solution to the problem. Well, we know there is a solution to the problem, but it's not man who has it. It's only God. And I want to tell you today, if you're thinking these things through, there is no solution to sin except the solution that God has. And that is that man needs to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, took our sins on him, shed his blood so that we could be forgiven, so that we could receive forgiveness and eternal life, and then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, a life that is transformed. And I, I love to tell this. I, I know you love to hear it. But, you know, before I became a Christian, I was a really good sinner. In fact, I was so good, I was thinking of going professional. <laughs> oh, I was a very good sinner. Uh, and when I look back at those times, I'm ashamed as to how I treated nice people. Because they didn't do things my way. And I'm sure many of us could do the same thing. I could not change. I wanted to. And I wanted to find power in some sort of spiritual thing that would help me change, but I couldn't change. But on, on the day that I came to Jesus, on January the 3rd, 1965, at quarter to 11, one night, and I told God all of my sins, and I asked him to come into my life, I got back into bed, and I felt what was on me, which was dreadful confusion, it clung to me like sticky mud, it was just washed right out of me as I lay in bed thinking, what on earth is going on? And in its place, joy started coming in through my feet, legs, up through my body, and filled the whole of my body, and I was transformed by the power of God. Uh, and I, I want to tell you guys, <laughs> you know, is it okay if I still keep on chatting? I, I used to smoke. And I, I used to swear. I, I was one of the best swearers around. I could get more swear words in a sentence than there were words in the sentence. Yeah, I was really good. On the day that I got converted, I stopped swearing immediately. Immediately. And I did nothing about that. I thought, what the heck is going on with me? And heck is a nice word, okay. And I did think that. What on earth is going on with me? I, I've stopped swearing. How come? But I had this real problem with nicotine. And uh, I want to say to... Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a father right now. Is that all right? Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to put their hands up. But if you smoke, you know, God has all the days of your life recorded in his book. And I have every intention of living till the very last one of them. But if I was still smoking today, I would be cutting those days short. So if you're a smoker, bless your heart. I love you with all my heart. But if you are, you are cutting your life short for all that God's planned for you. And there's only one thing to do. Quit. <laughs> I went to uh, London, Earl's Court, 
and uh, <clears throat> I was walking around uh, in Hyde Park and uh, God spoke to me. I'd been trying to quit smoking for three months and I couldn't. I was totally addicted to it. God spoke to me and he said this. He said, David, you have tried to give up nicotine and you cannot. Now I'm commanding you to. And when I heard those words, I knew I had the power to do it. Within 10 days, I had completely quit and I've never gone back. Within 10 days, completely quit. God has the power to transform our lives and to get us out of sin. But then again, there's an issue. What is the issue that man has? Well, very simply, it's this. The issue in your life, the issue in my life, and the issue in everybody's life is a question of your well-being. Will somebody look after me? Will somebody care for me? Will somebody be there for me? Will somebody encourage me when I need it? Will somebody just tell me what to do on certain occasions? Will, God, will somebody take all the fears away? Will somebody feed me? Will somebody look after me when I'm old? There are so many questions concerning the issues about my well-being and your well-being. And I know that's where fear comes from, isn't it? Will my marriage stay healthy? Will our kids turn out okay? And if they don't, will, will they come back? There's so many questions about life because well-being is such an important issue in our lives. Will I be someone who is significant? You know, I am so glad. I, I'm, I, I, I won't tell you my birthday, but Di knows. <clears throat> but my birthday's in a few weeks' time, and I'm going to be 73 years old. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I intend going on for quite a while. And I said to my family, I buried my dad, I buried my mum, I buried my brother, I buried my wife, I buried my niece. I've buried so many people in my family, I said to my kids, you better watch out. <laughs> I said, I don't want to have to bury you as well. But I'm determined I'm going to go on uh, and, and meet every one of those days that he has for me. And right now, I thank God I know significance. Here I am talking to all of you amazing people and hopefully sharing something with you that will help you. That is significant. And every one of us needs significance. And I know there are many people in this church who volunteer for this, who get paid for that, whatever, but the end of the day is you feel significant. And God wants you to have significance. And so here is an issue, an ongoing issue, about my significance. What is the answer? And the trouble is, of course, you see with man, is that man will try and obtain all the well-being that they need. But the thing is, there's always someone to block it, isn't there? You know, if you had it totally in your control, your own well-being, you might get somewhere. But the fact is, you don't. Because there's always someone who's going to block it, or a circumstance that will come across. And so, therefore, there is no guarantees. I'm, I'm just getting my exercise, by the way, okay? Just, that's all I'm doing. And so, therefore, we need to understand this, that if we're going to tie God's problem, God's issue, man's problem, man's issue together, the answer is simply this. We need to understand that God is our Father. He lives in heaven, but he's only our Father when we repent of wickedness. You know, we, we talk a lot in this church about an orphan heart, and, and we do, and if you don't know what that is, ask someone, don't ask me, because I want to go home early today. Um, but, uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, whether a person has an orphan heart or not, it doesn't matter what religion you're in or what non-religion you're in, the truth of the matter is, is what kingdom are you in? And you're either in the kingdom of light, headed up, by our Lord Jesus Christ, or you're in the kingdom of darkness, headed up by the prince of darkness, the God of this age. And God, if you are in the kingdom of darkness, God may be the father who created you, but he's not your father. You adopted another father. 
You gave yourself to another father, the father of darkness. And that's where your allegiance lies and that's where he gets his power to work darkness in your life. Jesus said to his disciples, your father in heaven, often said things like that. Those disciples loved Jesus, they gave their lives to him and therefore they had a father in heaven. That's wonderful. But he then turned around to the hypocrites, the religious people, and he said, you are of your father, the devil, who was a liar from the beginning. Now, this is the son of God telling them who their father really was. And I want to say to you today, first and foremost, that if there's anybody here in the sound of my voice, whether it's in this room or if it's on the, the, the podcast, and you don't know which kingdom you're in, you like the idea of being forgiven. You like the idea of God having solved the sin problem and wanting you to come home. And I, I love what Carlos Acondia said uh, in West Park. How many of you were in West Park last weekend? Wow, look at you. He kept on saying, there is a way back. There's a way back. And guys, I want to tell you this morning, there is a way back. You can come back to the Father who created you. By renouncing sin and wickedness, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, thanking him that his blood was shed for you so that your sins could be forgiven, receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then telling the devil, I am no longer your child, get lost. And if you're not clear on this issue this morning, I want, you to, I want to invite you to think about this very, very carefully. And we're going to do that in a minute. And this is where I've run out of anything to say. I remember a story. Preachers always lie, don't they? They've always got something to say. I, I remember a story, and this was, again, my spiritual father in Atlanta, Georgia. He was called to a, go to a hospital uh, by this lady who was a neighbor. I knew her. This lady had had a baby. The baby was very sick. Uh, and if you're sensitive, sensitive in this area, please forgive me, but sometimes you have to tell stories so that you're aware of what God can do. And he went to the hospital and the baby was dying. And he spoke to the neighbor and she said, Mr. Carter, can you please do something? And he said, well, no, I can't. She said, why not? He said, because you don't follow Jesus. And therefore, your prayers will not be heard. So there's nothing I can do for you. She then looked at him and she said, how can I follow Jesus? She opened her heart and he led her to the Lord. And the peace of God came upon her in such an incredible way she looked at him and she said maybe I can now go through what is inevitable at that moment in time the baby was just about to die there were certain signs that said a couple of minutes it's all over my friend Mr. Carter looked at her and he said well sister because you now know Jesus and you love Jesus Let's ask Jesus if he can do something. He went over to that baby. He prayed over that baby. And that baby was instantaneously healed. I'm not saying that that happens in every case. I know it does not. But the one thing I do know is this. That if you follow Jesus, if you take God's solution to the problem of sin and if you come back to the father then you will be put in a place where your prayers can be powerful and anything is possible amen amen, amen. let's stand okay shake yourself around now please be seated I mean that, sorry, please be seated. Yeah. 
shake the dust off. Just close your eyes, everybody please. I don't know everybody in the room, and so I want to ask you this question. If you are not sure that you are in the kingdom of Jesus, that your sins are forgiven, and that if you were to die today, you would go to be with Jesus in heaven. If you're not sure about that, <clears throat> and you would like to be sure, while everybody has got their eyes closed, would you just wave at me? Anybody at all? Thank you, I see you. God bless you. Anybody else at all? Just patiently waiting. This is a very safe place. We don't embarrass anybody here. Thank you, I see your hand as well, and yours as well. Thank you. Is that, yes, and I see yours as well. Is there anybody else? Yes, I see your hand. Thank you. Holy Spirit, just help us on this, please. Let your light come. Is there anybody else? I'll ask just for one more time. Somebody who hasn't put their hand up. So there are five of you who put your hands up. And what I want us to do as a church now is I want us to pray a prayer. And the whole of the church is going to pray it. <clears throat> but this is for you to pray possibly for the very first time. And what we're going to pray is we're going to pray thanking God for Jesus and what he did on the cross. We're going to ask for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to ask that Jesus should come into our lives that is specifically those five people who put their hands up. And we're going to thank him that we're now forgiven and we have eternal life. So please, loudly after me, would you pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood for me. My sin was put on him so that I could be forgiven. And I ask you now, Lord Jesus, forgive all of my sin. The things I have done wrong in my thought life, in my actions, and in my words, and even in my mind. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me from every one of those wicked and sinful deeds. Jesus, I want to thank you. Your word says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. So I thank you that I'm now forgiven. In the name of Jesus, I ask you, come into my life and be the power in my life. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that I now have received eternal life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Barry, I want you to stand up. This is uh, Papa Barry. Those five people who put their hands up, what I want you to do uh, is I want you to go and see him as soon as the meeting finishes, uh, which is almost now. And he's a lovely father. He's a father of the city. And he loves to talk to people who've just given their lives to Jesus. And uh, Barry, I, there's some books at the front here about So You Prayed the Prayer. So if you could use that, I'd appreciate that. So everybody can see Barry. Those five people, please go and talk to him in the name of Jesus. Now, guys, I want to tell you this. The angels of God are rejoicing in heaven right now. Come on, we ought to do the same. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Well, I enjoyed having a chat with you. You've been listening to a podcast from Life Spring Church, Wolverhampton. To find out more, 
go to our website, lifespring.uk.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs>